Hello, friends. Welcome to the Everything Went Black podcast. If you listened to the episode from a few weeks ago, I did a book report, for lack of a better term, on the Adam Smyers novel, Knucklehead. This week, Adam joins us for a wonderful chat that we had. In addition to being an author, Adam is an attorney, martial artist, self-proclaimed mediocre bass player, and that remains to be seen because I haven't actually heard any of his music. His debut novel is available on Akashic Press, and there will be a link in the show notes to where you can pick up his book. Knucklehead, that's your debut novel, and uh, I read it a few episodes ago. I delivered a brief, let's say, book report slash review on uh, on this. I'm going to call it a novel. Yet, it seems <laughs> that there is a component to this book which might be, may or may not be autobiographical, and that's what I kind of want to get to straight off. <laughs> Straight off. I love it because I usually just leave it at, you know, like novel with the air quotes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's 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 get into it. I'll, I'm going to say I'm going to say I'm just going to pick a number. I'm going to call it 70 percent autobiographical. OK. Yeah. Yeah. And um, if you haven't listened to the previous episode about the book, I urge you to check that out prior to this discussion that we're gonna about to have, because uh, the book though very interesting, might not be for everybody. And, um, but actually, I'm going to say that it could be for everybody because I think there is a little bit that most people can relate to, um, especially if you're a young man, you're trying to find your way in the world, and you're confused, and there's elements of chaos that you might feel are actively against you, and you're given a multitude of decisions to make. And the challenge is to figure out which is the correct choice in life. And I feel like that's kind of like, um, without, in a, in a very qualitative way, that's kind of uh, what I got out of the book. You know what I mean? That is so well said. I mean, my, my take, my, my personal view of, of young adulthood is, you know, the lesson that not everything that we can do is something that we should do, right? I mean, there was a time when I wasn't allowed to leave the fucking house. Yeah. And then... You know, you get to go to school and back. and then, But then at some point, just a few years after that, you got money. Nobody's looking for you. You're having sex. You're going out. You're doing whatever. And for me, the 20s were a time to, like, say, okay, look, I can, I'm allowed to cross the street now, but should I cross the street? And then pick up some of those sensibilities because the world is uh, the world's bigger than any one of us. And we have to pace ourselves, you know? Exactly. And the book, the setting of the book is the 1990s. And, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a few younger listeners that might have maybe been born in the 90s or have been very young to experience that. And the 90s have almost the same aura that possibly the 1950s had for me and you, being that you and I are, I think, roughly in the same age group, early 50s, late 40s, that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, so the the character Marcus sort of harkening back to uh, the work of say John Fonte, Charles Bukowski, and even Hemingway, there is the idea that that character is kind of an aggregate of personal experiences and viewpoints, and you confirmed that seventy percent of the story is autobiographical. So. What what is the um, the sort of mechanism in in developing this character? You know what? How did how did you uh, you know like what did you choose to leave out? What did you choose to include? Uh, did you have a specific story arc in mind for this character? And how much it, did it diverge from your actual life? Those are a lot of questions, and I'm going to try to do them uh, <laughs> one at a time. Sure, man. I would say. If I had, in, in very general terms, with lots of exceptions, for me, Marcus, my protagonist, is me with less impulse control. You know, we go through life, we have ideas, some good, some bad. Hopefully, we have some discernment, and we tend to act on the good ones more than the bad ones. 
Marcus's process is a little bit different. Um, he might do more of the things that we all wish we could do, you know, as if something something pops off on the train on the way home from work, most of us realize that we want to go home. We want to see our loved ones and we want to have dinner, watch TV, go to sleep, get up and do it again. Some people might feel like whatever's happening in that moment is is what they're doing and whatever they thought they were on their way to do is now on the back burner. <laughs> some people have time for things, you know. Uh, Marcus has time for things that, that maybe some of us don't. And that's that's good to write about. It's not so good to live necessarily, but it's good to write about. It's kind of the best of both worlds. Because yeah. you get to feel it without having uh having Lawrence. Yeah, that's that's an interesting um actually there's a similar a side I have to this story because our, our common friend Eugene Robinson, um the editor at large over at Ozzy.com on Facebook a few years ago, he put out this post asking for stories like that were true. Okay. So I wrote up a story, sent it to him. And, um, his response was like, yeah, this is great. You know, but where's the ending? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, well, there, there you know, there really is no ending. It, that was kind of the story. It had all exposition but there was really no climax or conclusion to the story. And I thought at that moment that I'm like, ah, this is the difference between actually writing a true biographical work and developing a work of fiction that is drawn from personal experiences. And then you assign another name to this person and they can live out what your possible outcome to the setting might have been. And, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of, method of fiction i always find very compelling and I'm, and I'm assuming that's something you enjoy as well there, there was definitely a phase in the writing process and, and writing this book took several years but there was definitely a couple of years uh in the middle where someone would read something and say that's not believable and i'm sitting there thinking but it happened <laughs> <laughs> and that's the that's the difference it absolutely is that the way life plays out fortunately uh often doesn't play out in the same way fiction does. It, it, it's maybe not as interesting. It's maybe not as clear cut. Uh, and, and, and so for me, fiction isn't uh, completely a way to accurately memorialize reality as to take reality, put it in a different form, put that in your head and create the reality there. It's almost like a, like Star Trek, like when you beam somebody over, like you take the reality and you turn it into molecules put the molecules in the reader's head and it turns back into Spock. And, and, and because if you try to do it too accurately, then it's journalism and then it's a memoir. And yeah. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go there. And uh, in some ways I find nonfiction limiting because what I'm going for is an emotional essence. I'm not, I'm not a journalist. I'm not going for reporting. I'm trying to have the reader feel something. What I like, is when someone, and this is, this is what the, your earlier episode, uh, earlier podcast book review was for me. My favorite conversation with the reader isn't so much when they tell me what they liked about what they read in the book as the own life experiences in their past that the book took them back to. You know, someone's feeling loss or uh, outrage or panic or, or joy in something I've written, and it takes them back to that point in their lives. And when they meet me, they tell me about that time in their life. That means I successfully communicated my reality, my experience into, into their head in a form that they can feel on a, on, a, on a very deep level. It's not intellectual, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there were definitely moments in the book that were very powerful in that respect. And, um, you know, personally for me, you know, I mean, you know, some of the listeners are familiar with the work I've done. And at this point, if they've been listening to this podcast for the last few years, understand like my, you know, my background, I'm this kind of suburban guy I grew up in a safe environment, yet I've chosen to put myself in these, not, not necessarily dangerous, but um, dodgy, you know, sort of uh, situations in life. And there's definitely been moments where I've, questioned some of the decisions I made 
And I thought about my parents, about how hard they worked and how they gave me opportunities. And they maybe have seen my life trajectory being quite a bit different than the trajectory that I currently put myself on or I put myself on years ago and where I'm at right now. And that the moments of your book that touched on that, where you're thinking about how you might be letting someone down or not living up to certain certain expectations that might have been placed on you. Those were to me the more the most powerful parts of the book. And um so yeah, I mean that you know that that was like a successful moment for me in what in as a reader, you know. That's excellent. Yeah, because it's very important to me, those moments. And and I associate this with young adults that it comes to different people at different times, but that realization, you know, I don't always have my own best interests at heart. That's a sobering thought. You yes. know, and I, I relate very much to what you're saying about the dodgy situation. But I grew up in New York, and, and there was one night when somehow I was downtown, and I ended up with all these homeless punks, and, and we went back to this a burnt out abandoned tenement with giant gaps in the floor. Like, you know, don't go over there or you'll fall and die kind of thing. And we were drinking uh, malt liquor out of a jug, like a, like a, like a cartoon hillbilly moonshine <laughs> giant jug. We brought the beer in that and we're drinking and whatever. And, and you know, it gets late and I say, you know, Oh, all right guys, that was fun. I'm going to go home. And they said, you have a home. And they were, um, they were stunned, like that I had some place to go to. And I remember skateboarding back out of the village, skateboarding uptown as fast as I could and feeling this gratitude that, yeah, I could go have my adventures, but then I could go home and they couldn't. And, you know, I don't know what it was that, that pulled me to that side, to that world. It might just be the knowledge that it's there, right? I mean, if you, if you're safe and, and, and insulated and educated and comfortable and privileged, but you know that there's something on the other side of the veil, certain kinds of people are going to want to see that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But also it's good to keep in mind is that when you're spectating in these other worlds, that sometimes there's consequences to that. And, uh, you know, when I was, when I was 19, I learned that, um, <laughs> I had some trouble in the law. I was 19 years old, uh, involved some violence, and I ended up uh, in jail one night. And uh, I spent the night in jail. It happened to be Super Bowl weekend, so they couldn't find a guy to come and post you know, bail for me. And I was living in Boston at the time, which is one of the most violent cities I think I've ever lived in. And um, I had to stay in jail for 14 hours before somebody came and... Um, and got me, you know, to, to get me out. I had, I had, I had my, I had the money for bail. I didn't have to tell my parents or anything. And I just walked out 14 hours later. And the idea of like, I have to tell my parents that I'm in trouble with the law. I didn't know what my future was going to be like. I didn't know what the consequences were, but it was quite a sobering thought because like up until that moment, when they put cuffs on you, you think you're James Dean and you know, you're, Oh. living out this movie and everything's cool and you know check this out and then suddenly you're in jail with oh. real criminals and your future is like you want to say hey look man i'm not this kind of guy but the cops are like yes you are because you're here <laughs> you now, were 19 i was 19 years old man yeah yeah and the cuffs come out, man. It's really, yeah, that's, that's a moment. Yeah. And, and I feel like all of those recollections came back to me when reading the book. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you have to make decisions to decide, okay, well, do I want to live up to my potential or do I want to, uh, you know, go into this underworld, you know? Those crossroads and, and as alien as that, night in jail might have felt like the idea that you could be quite used to it by now. Mm -hmm. There are those guys, you know, if you watch cops or something, they see the patrolman getting out and they're already assuming the position and they're like, are you in the case? They're putting their hands behind the back. Oh man, she started it. And, uh, you know, they weren't always that way, but repetition, you'll get used to anything. And so 
that's a that's a hell of a, a crossroads in life. Is like, is this going to be my one story, or is this going to be the first? And then I'm going to become a veteran of this. Like, yeah, you that's know, a hell of a commitment. And it, and it dragged on for like a couple of months because of the whole process of going to court and all this other stuff. And and uh, yeah, and that's where another lesson was learned because I was a you know a young white man who had been involved in this sort of thing. And it made me realize that that's not always the case for a person of color who would experience a similar situation would have a very different outcome in that situation. And, and a lot of that is touched on in the book as well, because it took place in the nineties. Uh, that was a crazy time with the Rodney King trials, um, you know, OJ Simpson and, all of that sort of stuff. Fucking is, Bensonhurst, man. Howard yeah. Beach, remember that? Uh, that yeah, was crazy. Yeah. Sadly, in 2019, it's almost a very accurate mirror image of that. I mean, it's almost the same thing. People, you know, black people are getting killed by the cops. You know, and it's it's a. Um, you would think that in the in the intermit, in, intermittent time in the interim that we would come a little bit further, but. It, Sadly, things really haven't changed that much. You know, the funny thing is I started this book in 2009. I started this book at the dawn of the Obama era. It did not occur to me that the period I was chronicling or describing would almost completely come back. Like there are militias and I'm going to L7 concert. <laughs> like, what, what year is it? <laughs> yeah. The band reunions are by far my favorite part of the fact that it's the 90s again. Yeah, yeah. The um, Actually, speaking of bands, in your bio, it says that you're a, a mediocre bass player. So <laughs> you, do you care to expand on that? Well, yeah, I love the bass. I, I'm, I'm definitely a bass player at heart. You know, it's funny. Once I picked up the instrument, I realized that I, I flashed back on every stereo I'd ever had with the bass knob dialed. But... You know, I know my limitations. There are some monster players out there, and I'm solid. People like playing with me, you know, but uh, I'm not the shred guy. I'm not the slap monster. I just like to get in there and make the whole song sound better, you know? Have you done uh, so I, played in bands? I've been in a bunch of bands, just weekend warrior shit, but I'm, I'm usually in a band for the last, you know, 20 or so years. I was a rapper in the 90s. That's really? kind of, that was my, that was some of the, the real life version that didn't make it into the book. Yeah, I was doing political rap over hard rock back before that was a thing, like at the, the dawn of the Rage Against the Machine era, they were doing their thing and we didn't even know about them doing our thing up here in the Bay Area. And, uh, and we had a nice local following. I think in hindsight, we were pretty successful. I think at the time, it was kind of what we were talking about. I had that young man, uh, dissatisfaction, ambition thing, and I was pushing and pushing, but, you know, we were playing the hate and the mission regularly, and we, we cut a little CD, and and it was, it was, in some ways, it's kind of like knucklehead set to music, because it's, it's more contemporaneous, because I was writing this stuff at the time, but it was just this, just trying to capture the madness of that time. It's funny, people like to say, oh, nothing happened in the 90s, because, you know, 9-11 kind of reset the clock for everybody. But 90s were, you know, to, in Tricky's words, uh, uh, you know, pre-millennial intention. Yeah, yeah, man. Tricky. I actually, uh, I met Tricky. Um, what? Maybe like 10 years ago, I think. Uh, the, the band I was playing in, we were playing South by Southwest. We were on tour and uh, we were part of a bigger tour package. And the package actually went to uh to do south by in austin and when you're there for a few days you end up doing all these like different showcases and everything and sometimes they combine tours and um so this tour i was on ended up being packaged at this gigantic venue outside of austin with tricky as the headliner so it was you know kind of like a heavy rock bands and then tricky and i remember mm. pulling up in the van and I heard this like intense sound coming out of their sound check. And uh, it was like, like bass that you 
could only be manufactured by a machine. You know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> like it was yeah. like samples and, and live drums and bass and, you know, backup singers and all this stuff. And I see Tricky outside, like shadow boxing and stuff, you know? And I'm like, man, that's, that's fucking Tricky from Massive Attack, you know? And it was, it was pretty awesome. And um, the show was great. He checked out our band. He hung out with our drummer. Unfortunately, I was uh, doing uh, the business end of things, and I couldn't really do a lot of hanging out that night. And he totally crushed his set, man. And I've, I've always been a huge fan. I love Massive Attack, and I think Tricky's like an incredible performer, man. He, he was part, largely the soundtrack of that time for me. Trip yeah. Hop happened just at the right time for my sensibilities. It was, I, was, I was right there. And I'm I'm so glad he's still around because that that sound man some good shit came out of the '90s. You ever share a bill with uh, Girls Against Boys? I never have. Uh, I've seen them play about oh, it's got to be like 15 times though, man, because they were always touring throughout the '90s, and then they were always on tours with bands that I wanted to see. Like I saw them with Helmet, mm -hmm. I saw them with the Jesus Lizard, I saw them with a bunch of, and I thought they were interesting, man, because they had they had the two bass players. And being a bass player, I'm sure you appreciated that. They kind of took totally. this like uh, post punk thing and made it like abrasive, and they had a lot of different elements in their music. You know, one of the bass players is my publisher. I, I didn't know that. Akashic Press. Jo is, is yeah, a Johnny Temple is is Akashic. No way. Yeah. Interesting. So that was a huge. That I think the the, the music lit thing was 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 part of that that instant chemistry and that symbiosis because for me they are they are linked you know i mean just art is art and i think i'm happiest when i'm hanging out with a bunch of different kinds of artists because then you're not hung up in the overly technical you know trying to define what you're doing but just like we are we're all on this artistic path in different ways yeah genres um i always i always like artists who create stuff and cross genres like the swans have always been like a huge favorite of mine and neurosis and bands like that and uh you know michael gira is always is the, where, where swans started to where they're currently at right now are two different places man and mm -hmm. you know they have like acoustic songs there's these really abrasive you know brutal noise things they did in the early uh years of their career and then the full band sort of bombastic um, intensity that they had, you know, live. And when, when people limit what they do creatively, I just think it's a total uh, disservice uh, to themselves and to anyone who might be interested in what they're doing, you know? Right. Get it out and then and experiment in different ways. And not only will different forms be more or less comfortable to a person, but more different forms will resonate with different people. Uh, dude, look at Eugene, Eugene Robinson. Yeah. Like, he's the poster child for that. You know, Eugene's been a huge influence on me, man. And, um, you know, it's I, I first, obviously, through music, I discovered him, you know, Oxbow. And uh, he's been on this show a couple times, and I interviewed him for uh, the Gimme Radio podcast I do, which is a weekly thing I do, which a lot of you guys out there probably listen to. And, um, yeah, martial arts, fighting, uh, his, he's an author writing, writing, yeah. you know, he's a, yeah. you know, he works as an editor. It's all, it's like every aspect of like, he's a fully expressed person. In, in, exactly. In exactly. Ivy league educated yeah. and will choke a fool out from the stage. Exactly. Like that's what he's, he's the whole package. <laughs> <laughs> you, you asked me, you know, how, how I met him. And it's funny because there are so many like, um, near misses or false starts i can't even really identify the actual beginning i think my wife got me a copy of fight yeah i think the full title is everything you want to know about getting your ass about ass kicking without getting your ass kicked exactly. That's the <laughs> and one. uh and I, I just i loved i that that book spoke to me like an intelligent discussion of combat you know there are a lot of those out there but that one that one was for me and then at some point you know discovered maybe it was uh Maybe it was a, you know, knuckle up or something on YouTube. But at some point our paths crossed and, and I showed up to, uh, to help out with the, the video, the first video off of their, 
current album. You know, I think the song's called "A Cold Well Lighted, well -lighted Place." Yeah. So I, I I I feature in that. So that was fun. Um, sat in with him and Nico uh, at a set at the chapel a little bit after that. And then he was good enough to, to write a blurb for Knucklehead. But the funny thing is that we went to high school together, but he was a year ahead. Ah, and I didn't, even, I didn't even know it. I didn't even, you know. So he, he comes from the same time and place, but he made some different choices than I did too. And he got to, he got to see Bad Brains and stuff because he wasn't scared to go to CBs. <laughs> yeah, man, definitely. <laughs> and, and when he was editor-in-chief of... Um, he was editor. I don't know if he was editor in chief of a magazine called Code in the nineties. Mm -hmm. That was I, I was a fan of his without even knowing it because it was a magazine that like the target demographic was educated middle class brothers. And not a lot of those. So I, I still have every issue somewhere down in my garage and I was just a big fan. They had they had, you know, it spoke to me. It spoke to me in a way that probably a lot of people take for granted. And fortunately, in ways that I'm starting to take for granted, because, you know, my, my book came out at a time when it's not in a vacuum. There are all these other works coming out. I'm, I'm part of a Knucklehead is part of a literary tradition that goes back to Baldwin and Wright and Gaines and, 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 and beyond that. But right now, in something of a golden age with Blackish and, and, uh, all of, all of the, the heavy books coming out, heavy being one of them. Um, movies, TV, literature, black voices are becoming more diverse and getting more airtime. And I think we're supporting each other and, and it's a beautiful thing and it's, I'm super psyched to be a part of it. So I guess you grew up in Brooklyn then, right? That's uh, where, where Eugene's from, out, out sort of. No, no, I grew, I grew up in Manhattan. I grew up in Midtown. Oh, okay, all right. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. Wow. That's uh. Well, anyway, I I didn't mean to, to pull you out of that, but I was thinking to myself, I'm like, wait, Eugene grew up here, and blah blah blah. All right. Okay. So you grew up in. You know. Manhattan. Yeah. I grew up in Manhattan. Um, and this this actually this relates to a couple of things because you were talking about young men and and choices. When I was a kid, uh, I I'd, I'd be walking to school. I'd be walking downtown to go to school, and there was this kid who be walking past me most days, walking uptown, presumably to go to school. I didn't like this kid, little skinhead. I don't know, what were we, 13 or some shit. Didn't like this kid, didn't know him, had never talked to him. But we would eyeball each other, man. Like most days as we passed each other on the street, we'd mad dog each other a little bit. And I was kind of thinking it's only a matter of time until we just throw our books down and just yeah. settle it without a word, because that's how it is, right? Yep. So I had this friend who I played Dungeons and Dragons with and, uh, named Cal. One day I go to Cal's house, and he's like, oh, hey, there's another buddy here to play D&D uh, &D with us. This is my friend, and it's the kid. It's the kid I don't like. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and he says, oh, this is great, man. It's great to meet you. You know, me and this guy, we didn't like each other. It was only a matter of time until we just threw our books down and just had it out right in the street. And, and, uh, and we were... We were good friends after that. And that kid was Harley Flanagan. No way, man. Wow. Way. Okay. He would, he would, we were his nerdy friends, right? So he would come play D&D &D for a couple hours and then do God knows what. I now know what God knows what was. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Fucking hanging out with Andy Warhol and Joe Strummer and, you know, but, well, it was still light out. Sometimes he'd come hang out with us. I, I actually interviewed Harley uh, twice. He was on the Gimme Radio show because, um, you know, the new Cro-Mags uh, yeah. single came out recently. And when his book came out, I interviewed him for um, a website called Clairvoyant. And it was a print interview that ended up coming out. And uh, what a fascinating guy, man. And, and did you read his book, um, uh, Hardcore? No, like but I, I'm looking forward to it, yeah. You know, it's it's great, even if... I mean, you obviously you grew up in New York. You're, you're, it seems like you're, uh, I, I actually, I didn't, I didn't confirm this with you, but are you a, you mentioned the bad brains, but are you in general a fan of that era of music of hardcore? Um, my tastes are, are varied and they don't go deep, but yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I gotta be honest. I'm not a big New York hardcore fan, but I like certain bands and I like the Chromax, Right, exactly. You know, and 
uh, you know, the Bad Brains, though hailing from D.C. originally, are the sort of adopted New York hardcore, you know, luminaries, I guess. But right, right. That book, though, that the uh, the hardcore book that Harley wrote is a great story. You know, has a you know straight up biography, but also gives a, a travelogue of like the early days of New York City. And not specifically just about hardcore music. It just talks about living in New York. And especially, you know, you being a native of this city, um, when you come back here, you see how things have changed and all this stuff. And that that's chronicled very, um, you know, very, very well in Harley's book. And it's it, it exists as as a document of that time, I think, as well as a biography of a, a guy who is someone that can be credited for architecting a whole style of music really that's i'm really looking forward to reading it now because yeah that the new york that is now no that, that is no longer visible is uh, is near and dear to my heart the last book i read about that was called a uh, hypocrite in a poofy white dress by my friend susan gilmore and uh, susan gilman and uh she really captured like the uptown vibe but I'm guessing Harley was more the downtown vibe. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like the village and Lower East Side. Yeah. That kind of thing. Oh, that's um, going to be nice. Yeah, what's what's this other book that you were talking about? What? Hypocrite in a Poofy White Dress. Um, uh, it's about a, a girl who grows up on the Upper West Side before it was the Upper West Side. Okay. Before it was gentrified. And, 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 and in fact, during that process and some of the tensions that came of that, but you know, it it was one of the first parts of, of old New York to kind of get paved over. It's funny because living there, it's got to be different for you. I go back a few times a year and I, I see the changes or I don't see the changes because for years I was kind of in denial. And when I would go home, I would just superimpose my memories on top of what my eyes were seeing. And, there, you know, there was a specific corner I called the 7-Eleven decades after they stopped being a 7-Eleven there. God, who knows what they, they sell? They sell mustard sandwiches. There. I don't know what they sell there, but it was the 7-Eleven. And slowly, I've been letting in the new reality. You know, the funniest part is when, you know, I'm outside and there's an outdoor table full of um, kind of precious looking young people and they're, they're sitting at the outdoor table eyeballing me. And I can remember watching a guy take a shit right on that corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are the kinds of things that people would be completely blown away by, those details. Yeah, we should have just like little plaques, you know, as a guy was stabbed right here. And But the, but I'm, I'm that guy now. I'm like, oh, that's great. I remember I got a gun pulled on me there. Oh, I miss New York. But there's got to be a sweet spot. There's got to be a balance between, you know, uh, Escape from New York and Disneyland. There's got to be. And I heard that there, in, in that process, there was a sweet spot sometime. I, I left in the early 90s, but apparently maybe late 90s, it had it had enough grit to be interesting, but you wouldn't necessarily get stuck with a dirty hypodermic needle either. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think you're right about that, because I definitely don't want to be living in the environment that Travis Bickle lived in either. Um, right. but also, uh, I don't want to be living in the environment that I'm currently living in where everything is a, a facsimile of something else, really. I mean, it's it's like living in Westworld or there's like virtual reality right now where, you know, people come to, to live here that have been sold this image of what New York is and that and, and what New York becomes reflects this image. So it's like this weird circular momentum that happens here. And uh, I just don't really enjoy it, you know, anymore. I mean, unfortunately, I, mean, I, I would like to move away at some point again because I've left the city many times and returned for you know reasons like I can't make money anywhere else, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very, uh, very strange environment right now. And, um, you know, you just you just encapsulated it perfectly, and and it gave it a name for me because now I'm thinking of it as New York Land. New York Land. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was New York, and now it's just a tr attraction. Yeah. You know. You know, and you know, places like the Lower East Side, like there, or the East Village, and things like that. Like there was um, a bookstore called See Here, which I don't know if you you know if that was something that was on your no. radar, but it was on um, East. 7th Street, maybe, each 9th, 9th Street. And it was this bookstore that 
you can go in there and these very liberal people owned it and you can find any kind of literature you wanted there. It was like, you know, for maximum rock and roll to extreme right wing political magazines, pornography, um, you know, underground comics, the feral house catalog, you know, that all of those books were sold there. And it existed without sort of promoting any particular viewpoint. You know what I mean? And it was just That's this like, free source for people to come in and decide what they, what they wanted, you know, what they wanted to explore. Wow. And I felt like that in a lot of ways, like that, that, and that store ended up getting priced out of the neighborhood and just disappearing. And, you know, who knows what happened to the people that, that ran it, but that, could never exist anymore in this city. You know what I mean? For, for, for financial reasons. And also I just think people are afraid of that type of freedom of thought, you know, because that, that idea of being an outsider has been marketed. It's been like monetized in some ways because everyone wants to be an outsider. Now everyone wants to have like their unique uh, thing that they're involved with yet they still want to remain within a box, you know? And I think that's one of the thing, one of the places where New York city kind of fails these days, you know, it's like there really isn't, there's this very regimented thing that goes on here. And a lot of it has to do with financial, you know, status. And if you're, you know, you can't really live in New York and, and be poor, you know, so you got to hustle all the time. Yeah. My friends are all that, you know, when I'm there, I'm on vacation, but it's, I think it's different making it work there. I mean, you raised an interesting question when, when I was listening to you just now, I was thinking, are there even really still subcultures anymore like there used to be where people were like legit on the outside? I, I don't feel like there is. I mean, so many things that used to like earmark you as being part of a subculture have been co-opted by advertising, you know, like graffiti, skateboarding, uh, you know, hip hop culture, like even the dance culture, like the rave culture, all that stuff has been co-opted and, you know, monetized somehow. So. It was very interesting that period when just regular guys were walking around dressed like hardcore skins. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> very interesting period. <laughs> that, that That's a look that I can never really uh, get down with, man, for me as, as like, <laughs> I, it's a seem too much like a uniform, you know what I mean? Like uh, the Doc Martens, the flight jacket, the shaved head, the whole trip with the suspenders and all that. I just like, yeah, it whenever there's like a group identity is when I, I start checking out. You know what I mean? Like, yes, when there's like a uniform, it implies that there's like a uniform thought pattern that goes on within that mm. sort of thing. And that, that's when I start getting suspicious about stuff, you know? Yeah, I can relate to that. In your book, you make reference to studying karate. So we've been hinting at uh, martial arts. So are you, are you a regular practitioner? Do you, do you get involved in any kind of style of martial arts? Not like I used to, but I was heavy into karate for many years. My dad was a boxer. So, I mean, when your dad's a boxer, you're a boxer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, found, found my own way in the, the, the Japanese styles in college and trained for many years at uh, World Sato Karate Organization. Oh, cool. It's, um, yeah, on a 23rd is where the headquarters currently is and, and trained there until I left New York. And some years after that, um, uh, a Bay Area branch opened. So I trained there for many years. I'm still a member there, but you know, to some extent that's a young man's game. It's, it, for me, the, 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 the mass has to do with healing. There was a time when you know, I could spar for hours and, and be kind of banged up and then go to sleep and wake up the next day. I was fine. I was like being a werewolf. And now it's like, you know, um, from time to time, whether it's the, the mosh pit or the dojo, I need to ask myself, um, is this worth becoming the story of how I got a bad shoulder? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, and some, sometimes the answer is yes, right? But you, I have to ask myself that. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I noticed the recovery is something that is is harder to come by these days. I mean, um, yeah, I, mean, I, I train regularly, you know, Muay Thai, and um, 
I used to do more gra- I used to do, I used to grapple a lot, but that took a real toll on my body, man. That I, I still have injuries from jujitsu. You know what I mean? Oh, that's funny because they swear they swear you won't get hurt. Oh no, every man. I, you know that's true. They're like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, you know, you, you get real like you get the lasting injuries. I think from jujitsu, like joint tears, stuff like that. Um, unless you're like fighting, like straight up, like doing pro kickboxing fights or you're risking head trauma. I feel like most of the injuries you're going to get from Muay Thai are, are like soft tissue damage. You know what I mean? Like you're going to get like, mm-hmm. bruised up and, you know, little aches and pains. But, uh, you know, you're not really getting blasted in the face too many times, like unless you're actively, actively competing, you know? And, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I got like bad knees, uh, bad shoulder, bad elbow, all that stuff from, uh, from jujitsu basically. And, um, like I still enjoy doing it. I just, right now I'm, I'm taking a, an extended break from grappling for that reason. That's I, I hope you can heal all of those up, you know, one, one last, one last good healing. Cause, cause yeah, where I'm at is I'm just trying to plateau. I'm trying to do enough so that I'm still fit and able to live my life and alert and capable of taking care of myself, whatever, whatever. But not to the point where like I'm all, almost like over sharpening a blade. Like at some yeah. point you're just wearing it down, no, totally. but the lessons are still there. And I think about, you know, just in my life, how, um, I, I, I do a lot. I, 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 I'm a busy person and I tend to follow through with things. And I was thinking how a lot of that comes from, you know, mixing it up with people, like having to go a set amount of time with somebody bigger and stronger than you, <laughs> you know, this, yeah. it, it, you, you acquire a, a certain set of expectations or something. And, and, and I, I do that now, you know, and I, and I, I owe, I owe so much of it to karate. It's, it's really just, I don't think it's an end. I think it's a means. Yeah, definitely a lifestyle. I think once you, you, um, start training in whatever, whatever form or whatever, whatever thing you decide to do, you, it's it's an incorporation into your life, and also you gain a certain level of calmness from all that stuff. Like a lot of it is like what you just described, you know. Like you can uh, totally yeah, you have this this sort of uh, by being it, but having to go with round into rounds with people, like at the end of that, you're calm, and you can yes. apply that stress response to other things in life. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah. and I think having having um tried oneself is important i think a lot of what's going on with young men is that they they don't know they don't know what they actually can do when it comes down to it because we don't culturally we don't really have that we don't have you know manhood training there isn't like a a bar mitzvah for everybody you know you just say okay well you're not a kid anymore but you're you know you're not a man either so go out and prove yourself and and it's it's uh it's nice to, in a structured way, test your limits and see what they are. Because then you know, and you don't have to test them on the street. Yeah, man. I, I can go on and on about this. I mean, in some of my uh, surlier moments, I remember having these discussions with people and just being like, you know, back in the when we were hunters and gatherers, they would just put you in the woods and you had to either kill a bear <laughs> or be eaten by it. And that's why there's so many fucking weak people around us. You know what I mean? They, they, don't they get survive. you started on. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. There's more of that <laughs> if you want to get me yeah. really started. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's important to have some sort of initiation into the real world. And, you know, for some people it's, it's, uh, you know, mixed, you know, martial arts, mixed martial arts, wrestling. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, I think it's important to embrace the physical world, uh, in, in that where that allows you to, and the controlled environment, you know, sort of prevents you from really getting hurt or hurting another person. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I got a buddy who kind of did that for his, his young man, but the centerpiece was, was public speaking, which is probably as terrifying for some people as a physical fight is for others. And so he just kind of made him face this, this thing. And then he did it. Yeah. That's something that's, uh, that's really tough to do, man, to get in front of a group of people and speak with their, their eyes yeah. are upon you and, uh, doing it in this setting where you're, you know, you're talking into a microphone and you're comfortable. And I got like a cup of coffee here and wearing flip flops and everything is like nice and mellow. 
is worlds apart from standing in front of a group of people and trying to express yourself. You know what I mean? That's a yeah. completely different trip. Yeah. The, um, the section of your book where you talk about the ministry show, was that true or was that a, an aggregate of several different shows? Um, I love ministry. I've been to a couple of shows. That was mainly a zombie show. That was mainly a Rob Zombie show, but for the time period that that was supposed to be happening in, it didn't work. Interesting. So yeah, I've 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 enjoyed some ministry shows. I lost my fucking mind at a Rob Zombie show at the Fillmore. Yeah, they uh, Rob Rob Zombie and and White Zombie in general. I think um, the early that's another guy who has started in one place and has continually changed over the years. And, yeah, um, you know. It, I don't like all of the material. Some of it I enjoy, some of it I don't. Some of it's like, I think it's cool. Some of it, you know, whatever. It's personal tastes. The one thing I have to say, and I'm going to make a hard stance on this, is I do not enjoy his films, unfortunately. Ah. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, it's, that's not for everybody, man. That's, yeah. that's, and there's, there's just enough of that vibe in the music that could be enough for a person. But, you know, horror has changed. It, to the point where not even all of it should be called horror. I mean, back in the 80s, you used to call it like splatter and stuff, right? And that's yeah. not your thing. If, if you're more of a psychological person, it's weird that we have one word that applies to a whole bunch of stuff like that. You know, I, musically, I've been with Zombie like the whole time, and I kind of feel like he's been trying to realize his vision. For me, uh, Hellbilly Deluxe was the high point of that original vision, and now he's gone off and he's doing some other stuff. Educated Horses was real cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think what I, what I, my, my sense of kinship with him is I, I feel like when I was sitting in front of the TV, eating, uh, Frankenberry, watching the groovy ghoulies, Rob Zombie was somewhere, wherever the fuck he's from eating, you know, Count Chocula, watching the groovy ghoulies yeah. <laughs> and looking, looking at his brother's Vampirella magazines or some shit. Like I just, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally feeling his scene. Yeah, he's um he's from like Massachusetts, I think. I think uh, okay somewhere north, like near the New Hampshire border, I believe. Uh, the name wow. of the town's escaping me. Um, the thing about his films, I think that he's a really interesting director. I I think that his writing is something I'm not necessarily fond of, but I think he can make a really cool looking movie with a lot of good set pieces in it and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, House of a Thousand Corpses did not disappoint. I was watching. I was thinking, I really do think I've seen literally 1,000 corpses. So <laughs> so kudos to you, Mr. Zombie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the question I have for you now is why writing? I mean, you have a career. You have another career which runs, you know, you use that to pay the bills. Yeah. yeah. What motivated you to get into writing? I, I've been writing. Like my whole life, I, I have a a short story <laughs> that I wrote when I was really little, and it was supposed to kind of be like like horror. It was about like witches doing some sort of ritual on a rooftop, and a little boy like discovers them and they murder him. And then the epilogue is we found this story lying next to the dead body of this brave little boy. <laughs> like it was like some sort of weird meta, like you know. And and uh, and the grade I got was A plus. See me because I think you know <laughs> little kids. Are right here, like, <laughs> I think I triggered some mandatory reporting requirements. So I've always that's that's you know, and I've just been writing steadily to no one in particular. And uh, I wrote a short story that I was pleased with, um, and I, I showed it to some people. And uh, a lot of the feedback, most of the feedback I got was. That's a great story. Maybe you could make the protagonist uh, not a black woman because it's too distracting. So <laughs> my wife found uh, a group called Vona Voices. Uh, it's a, the, the Vona Workshops for Writers of Color. It was this annual week-long retreat. And, uh, and I found my home. That was around 2006 when I, I went to my first Vona retreat and met Walter Mosley and a bunch of other people and, and kind of came out as a writer, like realized, okay, this thing that I've just been doing and not even just the writing, like, I'm glad that there's a, there's a job for this. Like I'll be, I'll be in the shower, like making up shit that like has me like 
teared up or fucking mad. I now realize I'm, I'm writing. Sometimes now I get out and actually write the shit down, but like there's this mindset and that mindset was nurtured over the years. And Knucklehead is actually my third attempt at long form. I wrote a couple other things, learned a bunch, but they didn't go anywhere. Right. Then, you know, sat down and wrote what I thought was a short story. Um, pretty cool. Later on, I, I wrote another short story and then realized they were part of the same arc and just kept writing and kept writing and kept writing, like I said, for years. And I did not set out with the intention of all of this happening. You know, I think if, if I had, it probably would have, you know, altered the timeline and, and, and things would have gone differently. I was just writing because I couldn't help it. And it's the, it's the reason I can think of for writing because writing is not super fun all the time. Like getting it out is fun, but then the next 80% of the process where you're trying to like make it better, that part can suck. Yeah, can and if imagine, you have a yeah. day job, yeah. And if you have a day job like me, it's happening early in the morning or it's happening late at night. And, you know, there are lots of other ways I could have wasted that time, but I'm, I'm glad that something came of this. The, the scariest thing was putting the book out there, knowing that it represented me and the best that I could do and not knowing what kind of reception it, it would get. And the only thing I can liken it to is taking the bar exam. Is that, is that a, you know, people go to law school and college and they got debts, but then there's this one test. And if you don't pass it, it's like none of the other stuff ever happened. So, and, 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 and it did happen. And if I had written the book and if it hadn't been well received, I would have still written the book. But the idea that like you, like you can, you can read this book and it opens up these, you know, thoughts you're having about your own life. And we're talking about like that, that amazes me because everyone's so different. We're all trapped in these little shells. We all have completely different experiences, different perceptions. These. Hello, I just lost you yeah, for yeah. a second. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, okay, I just had that's a all right. Little technical thing here. That's um, all right. Yeah, sorry, we're back though. Uh, so you were talking about writing and um, how how you connected how I connected with the material and then that's when we had the, um, the mishap. Well, yeah, just, just that it astounds me every time a person is able to take a, a, a nuanced idea and convey it to another person. Uh, we have a hard time with crude ideas, you know, but and that's why it takes years and years to, 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 to get something in a way that other people can appreciate. It's just, it, it's a miraculous process to me. Art, you know, not just writing, but all art. Yeah. You listen to a song and feel a certain way. It's and other people feel the same way. That's crazy. Do you have um, like a regularly scheduled time in which you work? Like when, for your writing, is it a daily thing? Is it a weekly thing? Do you have a certain amount of hours a week you want to put in? Or, you know, what's the, uh, the basic process? It depends on where I am with a, with a given project. Like right now, where I'm, I'm revising stuff, um, I kind of do it when I feel like it when I'm, when I'm deep into the, the production phase, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to get the pages together, it'll be more structured. And it's usually first thing in the morning. I, I like having written kind of more than I like the actual writing. It's like, it's like, like dieting or something, right? So if I can walk around and say, and I wrote two pages today, <laughs> then I like, I like to reap those benefits as much of the day as possible. And also it's just, it's just when I have time, when I'm, when I'm done with my day, I, I, there's not as much there, right? So I like to get up early and get the good stuff out. Um, I was quite disciplined by the time I, I finished Knucklehead, but I haven't always been. I, I'd say some really good advice that I got from Walter Mosley, in fact, when he was speaking to our, our group at Vona, was that um, one of the benefits of a regular scheduled time is that you start to condition your brain to go to that place faster. You know, because like, like I was saying before, it's not intellectual, right? I'm coming from a deep, deep place and I'm trying to speak to someone else in a deep place and you have to go there. It's like a, like a trance is too strong a word, but it's not just regular walking around state of mind and, and doing it regularly at the same time of the day. And I think, I think Walter might do it five or seven days a week at the exact same time is your brain starts to expect it. It's like, okay, we're going to get deep from four to five. And, well, and you probably you have you have more productive sessions when your your brain is already there waiting for you, you know. Yeah. 
Walter Mosley, detective fiction uh, character, easy. I can't remember the name of the character. Man. Rollins. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easy Rollins. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, man, well, I, I feel bad that I couldn't remember the character's name, but I, I remember reading some of the material like uh, several years ago. Interesting. And his crazy, his crazy friend Mouse, who was a heavy, heavy influence on, on me, and uh, and ho- hopefully by that I mean my writing. <laughs> but you know, well, Mosley also wrote um, a couple of books that were that were a huge influence on me in terms of Knucklehead. Always outnumbered, always outgunned, was the first, and I think there was a follow up. And this is about a, a completely different um, protagonist, Socrates Fortlow, I think his name was, who mm-hmm. started with nothing and and. and like homeless and builds a life and it's it's painstaking and agonizing and minuscule steps and you're just with him and and for those of us who have had to start over in life from time to time i i find it to be inspiring just the the anatomy of starting over yeah it's 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 grueling but it's also um very inspiring i should check that one out what's it called again yeah always always outnumbered, outnumbered always outgunned yeah, that one sounds interesting. It sounds like it's something that would uh, would fit into uh, the kind of mindset I'm trying to create here. Definitely. Yeah. Now, do you have um, plans for uh, another book or any more material that uh, you're working on currently? I, you know, yes. It turns out I'm not completely in control of what comes out and when. So uh, after Knucklehead, I wrote a collection of short stories that haven't really gone anywhere, I might return to them. Um, but they're, they're really out there. And a bunch of essays, which I generally don't, you know, I just, just write them just to have them. But this was around, you know, 2016, when things were getting kind of wacky and I needed to collect my thoughts. Yeah. Last year, I participated in the Open Book Festival in Cape Town. And it was the first time I'd ever been anywhere, let alone Africa. Yeah. And the shit changed me. And so... Um, I took several months collecting my thoughts on that, um, t- turned that into a finished essay. And a lot of that's about to be published in the Johannesburg Review of Books. Wow. Uh, I've also written another short kind of experimental project that I don't even really want to get into, but, but it's, not, it's not the sequel. It's not the knucklehead sequel that I assumed would be my next project. And, I definitely have at least one other, you know, long form literary novel in me. I just can't decide whether it's a sequel or something closely related or another, another very relevant writer for me is, is uh, Ernest Gaines. And, and he has protagonists that um, sometimes there are subtle variations on each other. And I think that's very useful because then you're not necessarily stuck with, you know, the, the history or choices of a, I, I, if I, if I write a sequel to Knucklehead, it has to, it has to encompass all of the bad decisions that Marcus has already made. Maybe I want to start with a cleaner slate and deal with different issues. So I'm still getting my mind around that, but I am always writing something. No, that's great, man. <clears throat> yeah. That's, um, I guess like when you stop writing is when you cease to be a writer. So <laughs> mm. yeah. That's how I feel about music, too, man. It's like one of those things where, you know, like related in some ways to the bad decision making processes that we talked about earlier. Um, There have been several moments in my life where I ran into people that I grew up with and they were like, oh, are you you still playing music? I'm like, I get angry because I'm like, what else am I going to do? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I don't know about you, but I can't stop doing this. You know what I mean? Even if there's no one out there listening to what I'm making musically, I'm still going to be doing it for myself, you know? And I imagine that's the same kind of calling that writing has for you. And and music, you know, because uh, for, for some time after, after the rap thing, I, I went through a period in the house where I would say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put away the home studio cause we need the space. And I put everything away and we have lots more surface area. And then, uh, you know, some little melody would come through my head or some concept uh-huh. and I got to break everything out and I'm the mad scientist in the lab and yeah. everything's huge. And now I, it's just out now, just, you know, there's just a studio because yeah, I can't, I can't stop that. The writing is, um, 
is more of a compulsive thing, but music is fucking fun. And I just, I just, every time I I play a bass, every time I pluck a bass string, it makes me happy. Do you, um, you mess around with any of the software that we got out there now? Like, uh, you know, Pro Tools or, you know, GarageBand, and there's all this like easy drummer stuff that's out there that if you don't know anything about drum programming, you can still like make songs. All I've got is audacity for just um i I was just in a project where we would shoot tracks back and forth and it's Mm -hmm. just a a way of 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 digitizing what i'm doing um i i just bought a cable that's an instrument plug on one end and a usb on the other that's the the full extent of my uh you know but i haven't messed with garage band and i I love live drums too much to really invest too much in non-live drums shout out to tommy my drummer (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad he's he's uh, must be happy to hear that you uh, <laughs> you still love live drums. Oh yeah, man, there's just nothing like it. Yeah, actually, um, I'm I'm on the same boat. But uh, you know, writing material, demoing stuff, it's like there's for years people have been telling me about this thing called Easy Drummer, which I finally started using about two years ago, and it's um, mainly for songwriting. It's just if you want to make a demo, you can pull in like basic. Um, you know, loops like, uh, you know, you got like a blast beat or like a double kick pattern or something. And it just helps you like actualize your ideas without having to just sit around with a click track going on the whole time, you know? Oh yeah. No, I mean, you're doing, you're, you're doing the real thing. Like you're, you're, you're doing the thing. I'm just fucking around. So yeah, I have a little drum machine that I'll play along to half the time. If I just kind of want to just improvise, I'll pull up a, a drum groove on YouTube and just play along with some rando. Yeah, that's cool. Which is also good experience because then you're playing with different drummers in a way. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, just technology these days, even though like I think that I find myself sometimes being kind of a Luddite when it comes to technology, I also kind of celebrate it too because I'm like, yeah, I can just stay home all day now and, and take the whole day, the whole weekend and just write material and have – pretty much a whole complete suite of songs really with bass drums guitar and if i feel motivated lay some vocals in and it's like wow pretty much ready to go for other people that are involved in the project to check out and be like well this is a piece of shit and it sucks or i like this one part over here but let's get rid of the other part and maybe you know, do something different there or whatever. You know what I mean? Oh, it's definitely easier than it was back in the day when you were having to play somebody some weird, like you, like some ambient recording where you're, you're strumming and humming and you've got like yeah. a microphone next to you and they got to make sense of that. You can, yeah, you can bring people into the vision more easily, just completely by yourself. Yeah. The funniest thing is I remember like years ago in the nineties when, um, you know, it was like the early days of a band that I was playing in. And I was like, man, we need something to, uh, you know, we need something to capture these song ideas. So I went to this, like, you know, st- I don't even know the name of the department store. And I bought, I'm like, I need something to record with. You know, I need a tape recorder. So I just bought like a boom box. That was literally, <laughs> that was the system of choice back then, man. A boom box yeah. recording. You just sit, hit play and record. And that's it. And then you had your ideas on a cassette tape. And then, you know, you flip the side over and you record more stuff on the other side. <laughs> Things have definitely improved in some ways. I, I can complain about, about all, how the storefronts have changed in New York all I want, but I wouldn't, go back to, I wouldn't go back to cassettes and shitty recordings. Actually, a good friend of mine, uh, my friend Dana Ambrose, who plays uh, in this band called Six Kills Nine, and he was also in a, he's also in a band called Keel Hall from Cleveland. He had a, a rap project where he was would record stuff on one cassette and then play that boombox louder, and he'd have another boombox where he would record him rapping over the material that was coming out of the other box. That's how he would multi-track stuff. And he had to, he had to press play at the exact same moment or? Well, he already had the music on one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, maybe there was some leader, you know, I don't know what his process was exactly, but like, 
you know, maybe there was a count off or something, and then he would press play and record on the other box. Ah, yes. Okay, so he would. That's how he multi-track. Yeah, okay. So, so if, he, if have, he wanted to throw something else on there, he would need to go back to Boombox One and record. Yeah, there you go. The vocals <laughs> and the beat, and then place. Oh, that's crazy. Hey, man, he made it work though. But it was like that. That's the kind of Stone Age tools that we had back in the day, man. And nowadays, it's like you buy a Mac computer and you have like unlimited tracks to record on with garage band or audacity or whatever it's, it's pretty yeah it's pretty funny i kind of get now why radio Shack didn't make it because that that mindset that was the like you know you go out and two in the afternoon because you need like the little doodad that connects the the eight inch mono plug to the quarter inch stereo plug because you you know you're using your stereo as a fucking guitar amp or some <laughs> shit but now it's you don't have to do that anymore. So what, what, what the fuck is Radio Shack supposed to do about that? Yeah. Actually, to go one step further with all this recording, man, there's the same company that makes this easy drummer uh, has, it's called Tune Track, by the way. And this is not a, a uh, advertisement for them. I'm just telling you guys what's out there. There's, uh, they have a whole suite of amp models too, where you can plug in, you know, plug into a, a DI box, you know, USB connection into your computer. You have like whatever uh, you know st system you're using, uh, Pro Tools, uh, you know whatever GarageBand, Audacity, and then you have a multitude of different types of amps you can play through, and it even goes down to the point of like how you want it, what kind of cabinet you want, what kind of amp, where you want the mic placed on it, and it actually sounds pretty good. Like I have made a bunch of demos using that stuff, but I haven't, you know. I yeah, I was going to ask you if it sounded good. I mean, people have been trying to do that for a while, but if you can go in dry, then you can you can experiment. Then yeah. then you're not committed, right? Then you're like, I want to play through a cranked Marshall or I want to play through an orange or... Yeah. That's yeah. pretty sweet. It sounds pretty good, you know, and it's... Uh, yeah, that that's the world we live in these days where you can just... Uh, eventually, we're all just going to be in these pods where we don't really do, we just, our, our minds manipulate these things. <laughs> is, is that good or bad? I think that's bad. I mean, it might, be, <laughs> it might be bad for us. It might be good for the next thing that is going to be coming after us. But for mm. humankind, I think it's bad. You got to experience the physical world in some way. Mm. Well, thank you very much, man. This is a great, uh, conversation we had and in yeah. closing are there links or where can people go to purchase knucklehead online uh can you find this in barnes and noble like give us the whole rundown of all the places you can go and get the book you know i i would say uh wherever fine books are sold man i mean it's i used to i used to pop in it on bookstores to see if they had it some had it some didn't it's available online uh, amazon of course if you have other choices uh, the easiest way is probably to go straight to the Akashic website, Akashic Books, um, and search for my name and or Knucklehead. But for better or worse, those two words are, are linked now. <laughs> Smire Knucklehead. Um, and and you can just get it there. It's available on audio and uh, and Kindle. The audio book, interestingly, um, was read by uh, a man named Stephen Taylor. He plays... Um, He's he's in the Lion King as Mufasa. Oh wow! He's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he's got, voice. got a nice voice. Yeah, yeah. got a, did a good job. So whatever your whatever your form is, there's a knucklehead for you. How do you um, feel about the the audio book? Are you are you a listener of audio books? You ever check those out? I'm not there yet, man. I'm still paper book. I, I have nothing against it. Uh, I guess next step, uh, Kindle, but. I mean, I just, it's muscle memory. That's just still how I'm, I'm still buying paper books and reading them and folding down the corners. I'm in the same boat. I, I haven't, I've done some work for audible.com over the years uh, as like an editor, but uh, I can't, I just, I just lose my, my attention is, it's not the same type of intention. You know what I mean? I, um, when I read, I feel like I retain it more when I'm actually, my eyes are being engaged. It feels like I retain the information more. Oh, I definitely do. Even compared to reading on a screen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I haven't tried the uh, Kindle yet, but, uh, you know, that I, I guess like 
for traveling, that would really be the the most um, reasonable thing to do because uh, yeah, you know, I do quite a bit of traveling over you know just regularly with the band and everything. I was on flights and stuff, that sort of thing. Right. And rather than lugging, you know, a couple of different paperbacks with me, I could probably just bring a, a Kindle or a, use the Kindle app or something like that. Yeah, there are huge advantages. Plus, the actual surface that people are reading on, I think, has gotten a lot better. It's not it's not like reading uh, on a laptop, I think, if you have a Kindle. Ah, yeah, I'm going to try that out. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. And um, yeah, I look forward Thank to, you. Uh, you know, yeah, this is great, man. I, I had a great time. Yes. Yeah.